everyone! In today's video I'm just going to be going through some of the math skills you might need within A-level psychology. Because this video is probably going to be quite long, I'm going to try and leave some time markers as to where each section starts within the description. First of all we have percentages. And actually the easiest way to show you how to calculate a percentage is through the use of a scenario. So the scenario here is that 59 people have taken part in a survey about where they like to shop for food. 24 people said their favourite place to shop is Sainsbury's, 14 said Asda and the remaining 21 people said Tesco. The first question we've got here is asking what percentage of people said Tesco. So what we do to work this out is take the total number of people who said Tesco, which is 21, and divide that by the total number of people, which is 59. However, you may not always be given the total number of people, and to work this out, you simply just add up all of the numbers you have. So that would just be 24, add 14, add 21. You would then times your answer by 100 to change it into a percentage. And when doing this, you should get an answer of 35.59% of people having said Tesco's. Here I've just got some additional questions you might like to try. You will notice that the final question is slightly different to the others, in that it asks you what percentage of people didn't say ASDA. To work this out, there's two approaches you can take. You can either add up the percentage of people who said Sainsbury's and the percentage of people that said Tesco's, or you can work out the percentage of people that did say ASDA and take this away from 100. Either way, you should be getting the same answer. Now we're going to move on to percentage increase and percentage decrease. And once again, it's probably easier to show you how to do this through the use of the scenario. So you have 134 participants agree to take part in your study. However, several people decide to withdraw. You are left with 97 participant responses. What percentage of people withdrew from the study? The first thing you need to do is work out the decrease. In order to do this, you need to take your original number, which was 134, and take away the new number, which was 97. This leaves you with the decrease of 37. What you then want to do is take your decrease number, so 37, and divide this by the original number, which was 134. You then times this by 100 to make it a percentage. And when you type this into your calculator, you should find that there is a 27.61% decrease in the number of participants. Now we have a percentage increase question, and the way you calculate percentage increase is pretty similar to how you calculate percentage decrease. So our scenario here is that 43 people have agreed to take part in your study. However, you need at least 50 people. After a final call for participants, you find you have a total of 79 people willing to take part in your study. So the question here is what is the percentage increase in your total number of participants compared to what you originally had? So the first thing you need to do is calculate your increase. And to do this, you take your new number, which is 79, and take away the original, which was 43. And this leaves you with 36. So this step is somewhat different from decrease as in decrease, it was the other way round. What you then need to do is divide your increase, which was 36, by your original number, which was 43, and then you times this by 100 to make it into a percentage. And when you put this into your calculator, you should find that you get an 83.72% increase in your number of participants. Now we're going to look at turning decimals into fractions. As I said here, there are some decimals that you should already know. For example, 0.25 equals a quarter, 0.5 is a half, 0.75 is three quarters, and then this here is just showing you that anything that has one decimal place, so e.g. 0.3, just goes over 10. So 0.3 equals 3 over 10, as would 0.6 equals 6 over 10. In order to change a decimal number into a fraction, the first thing you need to do is look at how many decimal places there are after the decimal point. So for example here, you can see that 0.64 has two decimal places, which means that you can put this number as a fraction over 100. If there were three decimal places, you'd put it over 1000. 
Then what you want to do is simplify your fraction as much as you can. So as I said here, you may see straight away that there is a common number in both your numerator and your denominator. And so you can simply just divide this common number to get your simplified fraction. However, you may not see a common number straight away. And so what you can do, as long as both the numbers are even, is first divide by 2 and see how much further you can do this. So for example, for the number 64 over 100, you'd first divide this by 2 to get 32 over 50, and then you can divide this by 2 again to get 16 over 25. Once you've done that, there are no more common numbers between them. And because you've got a calculator within the exam, providing you've got the time, if you do find that you've got an odd number or two odd numbers, you could sit there and quickly go through and see if they're both divisible by a certain number. Next, we've got ratios. So there are two main types of ratio that you're likely to come across. You've got your part to whole ratio and your part to part ratio. And here I've got yet another example just so I can clearly show what both of these are. So you have just conducted a study and found that 24 people prefer vanilla ice cream while 17 prefer chocolate ice cream. So your part to whole ratio for vanilla would be 24 to 41. And of course the 41 is your whole ratios added together, hence the name part to whole. So 17 plus 24 gives you that 41. And then your part to whole for chocolate would be 17 to 41. Again, your 17 comes from the question and the 41 is the total of both ratios added together. Your part to part ratio would mean that you just need to take both parts given to you within the question. So this would just be 24, which comes from vanilla, to 17, which comes from the chocolate. And here I'm going to go through another type of question that you could be asked using ratios. So Lisa and Kelly gather a total of 342 participants. They decide to share them in the ratio 6 to 3. The question here just wants you to work out how many participants Kelly will have. So the first thing you need to do is take your total number of participants, which was given to you in the question as 342, and divide this by the total ratio. And to do this, you just add up each ratio part. So here we just have the two, which are six and three, and adding them together gives you nine. When you do this, you get a total of 38. So 38 represents one ratio part. Next, what you do is you times that one ratio part, so 38, by Kelly's share of the ratio, which is 3. And in doing so, you'll find that Kelly's share is 114 participants. Next, you've got significant figures and rounding. So, in a question, how many decimal places should you use? So, what you need to look for is if there is already a number within the question that has a set amount of decimal places. If there is, you should use the same number of decimal places as that number in the question when given your answer. So for example, if there is a decimal place in the question that is 6.02, then in your answer, you should give it to two decimal places. If there aren't any numbers already in the question, what you should do is give your answer to a few more decimal places, for example, four or five, and then you should round to two or three decimal places depend on what you think fits best. Next, we'll look at rounding. So, say you have the number 11.53947 as your answer, and you want to round to two decimal places. What would your number be? What you would need to do is look at the third decimal place. If it's over five, you round the second decimal place up to the next number. But if it's less than five, the second number just remains the same. So as you can see, our number here is a 9. Because that's higher than 5, we'd round the second decimal place and our answer would become 11.54. So with rounding, you always look at the number next to how many decimal places you're rounding to. So if you're rounding to two decimal places, you look at the third number. If you're rounding to three decimal places, you look at the fourth number and so on. Now looking at significant figures. If you are asked to give a number to a certain amount of significant figures, what should you do? So with this, the important thing to remember is that only the numbers after the first zero count as your significant figures. So looking at some examples, here you need to leave your answer to three significant figures. 
So the first number of 6.747585, you'd round the third decimal place so that it would become 6.75. With the second example, the first four zeros don't count as your significant figures. Instead, your significant figure would become 0 0.000573. And I've just given these next two examples to show what would happen with a larger number as opposed to a decimal place when you still need to leave it to three significant figures. Next, you've got your mean, median and mode. To calculate the mean, all you need to do is add up all of your numbers and divide by how many numbers there are. So for example, in this data set, if you were to add up all these numbers, you'd get 49. Because there are 10 numbers, you'd need to divide by 10, which gives us a mean of 4.9. When calculating the mean, if you see that there's an extreme value, it's usually best to remove this value and calculate the mean without it, otherwise it will severely skew your mean value. And then in order to calculate the median, what you first need to do is order your data set from values highest to lowest, and then you take the middle value. To do this, you can simply cross off the number at each end until you get to the middle. If you have an odd amount of numbers, you'll find that you just get the one single figure. However, if you have an even set of numbers, like in this case, you'll find that there's two numbers in the middle. And to do this, you just take the middle number that's in between these. So in this case, it's easy enough because both numbers are four, so it would just be four. You've then got the mode, and this is just simply the number that appears most frequently. And in our data set, this was three. Next, you've got your range and standard deviation. So in order to calculate the range, you need to subtract the smallest number in your data set from the highest number in your data set. And then also, sometimes one is added. However, mark schemes usually allow for you to not add one, and I personally never did add one. So once again, we'll take our same data set, and the highest value here is nine, and the smallest value is two. And if you do 9 take 2, you just get a range of 7. And then you've got your standard deviation. So you don't actually need to know how to calculate your standard deviation. Instead, you just need to know how to interpret it. So standard deviations usually lie between minus 3 and positive 3. And the normal slash mean value is 0 in the middle. Therefore, the further away a number is from the mean, the more spread out the data is and the more the value is extreme. In a question, you may be asked to compare standard deviation values. For example, a value of 0.3 and a value of minus 1.6. So the kind of thing you could say is that the value of 0.3 is closer to the mean and is less than one standard deviation away from the mean, whilst not minus 1.6 is more than one standard deviation from the mean and so is a more extreme score. Here I've just got a picture of the normal distribution. The numbers below indicate how far each standard deviation lies from the mean, just so you can visually see how it compares. And finally here, I've just listed some advantages and disadvantages of the mean, median and mode. This isn't necessarily your math skills, but these are things you need to know and that you could be asked about. So feel free to pause the screen and have a look through them. So I hope this video was somewhat useful in showing you the different math skills you need for A-level psychology. As always, if you have any questions, leave them down below and I'll try my best to get back to you as soon as possible.